This is Port Stories, brought to you by the Ports Past and Present Project, sharing stories from five port towns in Ireland and Wales, Dublin, Rosslare, Hollyhead, Fishguard and Pembroke Dock, funded by the European Regional Development Fund through the Ireland-Wales Cooperation Programme. Hi, welcome to the Port Stories podcast by Ports Past and Present, which is a European regional development project um, that's funded by the Island Wales Cooperation Programme. Uh, Today I'm here with my two colleagues um, and we're going to be talking about heritage. Uh, What is it? What are the different ways you can define it? What perspectives can you have on it? And what are some of the complexities of it that we've established that we're dealing with in the Ports Past and Present project. So firstly, I'm James Louis Smith. I'm a postdoctoral research fellow at University College Cork on the project. And I work with uh, storytelling, um, putting together digital stories, heritage material on our website and our app, which is called uh, Port Places. I'm Risa Singer and I'm based in Aberystwyth University and I work for the Department of Geography and Earth Sciences and it is my job on the project to develop a series of short documentary films about the five port communities that we're working with and the three ferry routes in between. And out of those short films we're also going to produce a long documentary film and the entire content is based on our work with members from the community. Hi, my name is Claire Nolan. I'm a postdoctoral researcher um, at UCC on the project as well. And my responsibility is really stakeholder engagement and also, like James, um, exploring the stories of the different ports. So now we're going to talk about heritage and we've uh, agreed on a series of questions we'd like to ask each other. And um, basically our first question uh, is, uh, what is your own personal background and why does heritage matter to you and what does heritage mean to you? So I think I'll start with Rita and ask that question, then we'll go to Claire, then back to me. My own personal background is that I am a German immigrant in Wales and I have lived in Wales now for just under eight years, working largely on Welsh history, heritage and literature. And with my German background, um, I think I can bring a little bit of perspective um, to working with heritage, particularly in this project, um, as we're looking at underrepresented voices, because personally, I come from East Germany and having grown up as a child in East Germany and then virtually overnight, that culture kind of disappearing on television screens or in the radio or on film, I can kind of connect to people who feel that their stories don't tend to get heard in like the larger mix of voices and that's why I feel very passionate about helping people to achieve that story spreading their stories in in that sense and um, also then have wider access to their heritage and in a way also preserve their heritage because more people become invested in hearing about it, finding out about it, and thinking that this is something worth to preserve. Um, well, my background is, um, it, it, I suppose, well, I'm, I was born in Ireland, and brought up in Ireland, um, but as a from a young age, had a very deep interest in old things and um, ancient sites, um, just a fascination. And as I got older, um, my feeling that I had from these places is they they helped to ground me. There's something about being in contact with uh, old things and ancient things that that ground me and, and give me perspective. Um, and so I um, later on went to train, I trained as an archeologist originally and then, and worked in archeology, span but then went into psychotherapy and worked with communities um, and their mental health for many years and then came back into heritage uh, because I felt that there was something about heritage that could be healing for people. Um, And I still feel that. And in the work I've done in recent years, 
um, people have definitely communicated that to me. So uh, I I feel that it can it can ground people, give them a sense of place, meaning, and it can also um, help people to work through difficult heritage. No more than psychotherapy can help people to work through their own personal heritages and their own difficult heritages. Uh, I think heritage practice can uh, help us to work through maybe collective issues that we have. And so uh, I feel that any any if any community, especially in this project, that connects more deeply with its heritage, uh, I think it can be it can be good for their well-being on, on a range of different levels. And for me, I um, grew up in Western Australia, in Perth, uh, and I'm, I should add as well that one of the reasons heritage sort of is an issue for me is that there's always that tension in what are called settler colonial societies between the culture of, in my case, our white Anglo-Australian um, and, and the the heritage and the lived experience, the um, relationship with country, as it's called in Australia, um, of our First Peoples. Uh, so I actually grew up on um, the land of the Wajuk Noongar people who uh, remain the spiritual and cultural custodians of that land and continue to practice their values, languages, beliefs and knowledge uh, today. So I've always, uh, going through university, doing a humanities degree, doing history, literature, uh, and I've always had that sense of um, multiple overlapping and often conflicting senses of heritage and of what history is, um, in, as well as that um, in the context of port, past and present, you know, I grew up on a, a port, in a port uh, that is on the Indian Ocean, West Australia. Uh, Perth is the most isolated capital city in the world. Uh, but the Indian Ocean region was one of the liveliest, busiest areas in pre-modern, uh, you know, trade the whole Indian Ocean from East Africa all the way around um, at, you know the Arabian Peninsula India Southeast Asia China that was where the bulk of the activity of of the you know the all the way from sort of the you know all the way through what we call the European Middle Ages that was where things were happening that was where where the center of gravity was in the the coastal world of um massive vast sweeping maritime routes so that sense of like centers and peripheries and heritage is like recentering where is important and whose community it is has always been very important to me uh so as a follow-up to that uh we i also it's also on here if either of you Rita or claire want to talk to this why is heritage relevant um if anyone wants to add anything um i can respond to that yeah i think Heritage is relevant on so many levels that aren't aren't apparent. I mean, there's so many different uh, dimensions to heritage in terms of, like I mentioned earlier, there's personal heritage uh, within your own life. There's uh, your personal heritage within your genealogy as well, and then it, and then it moves out into community, regional, national, international, um, and and maybe some ideas of universal heritage. But I think. It always enables to give us a perspective on our our lives in the present um, through connecting us to past peoples and past ways of life. Um, it gives us that distance to look at what we've done in the past, what we've done well, what we've done badly, um, and and then to you know to work with that. I think um, in the present, so. I think it's I think it's uh, immensely relevant actually to to everybody's lives because it's a, it's the repository of human experience either tangibly or intangibly. Um, yeah, I, I also think that heritage is hugely important, um, especially because it on the one hand it connects us each on an individual level, but at the same time, when you look at shared experiences of humanity there's there's always things that we will have in common like sharing food with one another um to build a bridge so it doesn't matter whether by heritage you are eating a plant-based diet or whether there is a lot of meat eating going on the, the point is that members of your community in order to reach out to each other very often that involves the exchange of food and that is i think that's a really nice way of, of building bridges um, and, and these shared experiences, if, if we can 
talk about that and find the commonality, I think it will help to build acceptance by just seeing that even though we may be eating different things and that there's different kinds of food on our table, that we all share this this one particular act um, of eating together. And that is part of our heritage. Um, and that is something that it can be a very abstract concept, but you can break it down very easily when you look at particularly um, such intangible practices like sharing food with each other. Um, and I think that kind of neatly brings us to the next question. What implications does that have for ports past and present and for the port communities more broadly? Because this is one thing that we realized very early on in the project that the Irish Sea is not so much a separator between our communities, but it actually helps the communities to connect with that with each other across the Irish Sea. And it's more a shared body of water, um, like a highway between the communities on either side of the Irish Sea, the, the communities in Ireland and in Wales. But James, what do you think, what, what implications does looking at heritage more broadly um, have for our project? Well, you mentioned intangible heritage, but I think that's that's a really important uh, point that we've had to figure out how to document the fact that there are lots of heritages for a port community. I mean, there are very visible industrial um, heritage related legacies, you know, infrastructure, military fortifications, you know, martello towers, gun towers, uh, uh, graving docks, you name it, you know, there's, there's um, very, very visible physical heritage, um, lighthouses, that kind of thing. But then there are your more intangible cultural heritage, you know, like UNESCO describes intangible cultural heritage as, you know, oral traditions, performing arts, social practices, rituals, festivals, knowledge practices concerning nature, for example. Um, all of those are things that the, like um, we've been trying to tell stories of, of people's practices, people's uh, songs and stories and um, that, that that is equally important. I think that that would be my main point. Um, maybe you have something else to say, Claire? Um, yeah, I think uh, I agree with you, James. I think definitely the intangible is very strong in this project and especially um, I keep mentioning genealogical stuff, but I know that um, some of our stakeholders and, and communities uh, really value that, that you have similar uh, family names, surnames on both sides of the Irish Sea. And then that creates this sense of connection and um, and then that, that's reflected in maybe connection to place that if we, as Rita says, view this whole area not just not as separate places but as joined together or almost extensions of each other um especially with some of the stories from the past as we've found in the project that we are connected in these tangible ways too and uh, and that there's so much meaning there for for communities on both sides of the sea and th that actually that can um really um enhance people's life i think their their lives their quality of life and their sense of place and their connection and and uh and how their surroundings you know um facilitate to their daily lives um so yeah that would be my sense of it so far but um that kind of brings in uh, another question that we've been talking about is uh who contributes to heritage and who can take ownership? Who's, whose heritage is it? I, I don't know, Rita, if you want to respond to that. Um, well, hopefully everybody contributes to heritage. Well, everybody does, to be honest. It's just a question, I think, attached to ownership. Um, who is more or less in and who is out? Who is, who is allowed to take ownership of heritage? Um, recently, there has been a book released in, in Wales, um, it's called Welsh Plural, and a young musician, folk musician from Wales, she has written a very brilliant essay um, about the tradition in capital letters and who is allowed to take ownership of, of that musical intangible tradition in Wales. And her main contribution or her main argument is that essentially this tradition is there to change. So if you look at things that remain stable over several generations, but 
the only reason why the tradition survives is also that it is malleable, that every new generation, every new participant can contribute something new to, to keep that heritage alive, because otherwise it just becomes fossilized. Uh, it's going to start sitting on a shelf where nobody is no longer contributing to it. It turns into a museum piece that nobody has any use for, apart from dusting it off every now and then, just looking at it. So I, I think this, this ownership question and, and contribution question very much revolves around hierarchies. And um, I think it maybe has something to do with how secure a community can feel about themselves. Because if you feel very much under threat, the more likely you're probably to hold on to what you believe your heritage is. And you may get into a sense of feeling that, no, things shouldn't change because otherwise we're going to lose this. So that's also why I think a lot of it has to do with feeling empowered to take up your heritage and to, to proudly live it, but also not being afraid to change it. I guess one thing I would say is that practices and heritage in general are enormously plastic. Like a lot of the things we think of as having always been a particular way have are just layers and layers of things added on top of each other, you know, like a medieval quote unquote church or castle or whatever is probably it's got like or like hundreds of years of additions like layers and layers on top and song is the same and everything is and it's so and i also think that coastal like ports particularly make a bit of a nonsense of a sort of rigid unchanging idea of heritage because they are melting pots that people pass through all of our port communities have enormous amounts of um movement to and from all over the world they're all part of these vast you know especially between the in the you know the across the irish sea you know uh colonial networks and networks um of of you know movement back and forth between these islands um and they they change and they're constantly in flux um and having an overly monolithic or rigid idea of what heritage is and who it belongs to uh really diminishes the power of the heritage and the power of the story. And I think that those who are keepers of that heritage are often the people that understand that the best. And that's something I've learned from listening to people with our project. Um, yeah, I, I kind of agree with you both. Um, but at the same time, I'm aware, and this kind of leads into our next uh, question is about is heritage contested and whose heritage are we referencing in our project? Um, I know just from discussions with people with First Nations peoples in the past from um, in Canada. And um, they, you know, they feel that they've lost so much of their culture and their heritage that they, like Risa said, they hold on to it very strongly and they're very careful about who they involve and who they allow to share in that culture. Um, and, uh, and for some, they don't even want uh, non-Indigenous people learning their languages. Um, so, I think it's a very sensitive subject and I think it depends. I think sometimes people are ready to share and then sometimes they're not ready to share. And that I think um, we need to, as heritage practitioners, we need to respect where people are at with their journey of, of how they manage and, and preserve their heritage. Yeah, I think one thing as well with, um, you know, who, where is heritage contested and, you know, who has ownership of it when um, a community does choose to put knowledge into a, a domain where it can be, you know, shared and understood by others. Um, basically, there's an obligation about managing, like for us in the project, that a lot of what you would call heritage is also data in that we, we're responsible for ensuring that people in the future can find it, access it, that it's interoperable, which means that others can, you know, can be used for different projects and reusable. But we also have an obligation, you know, and we, we make sure when we license um, and sort of uh, commission certain materials that we make sure that there's a sense that it's for collective benefit and that the uh, those who contributed have an authority to control it, you know, and that 
that we make ourselves responsible for heritage data that we've created within the project. So when someone does choose to share, it gives, it makes, um, there's an ethical duty then to be responsible for it. So I guess one other thing that I could uh, say as a new uh, question is, um, what can heritage teach and who is it teaching? Uh, maybe Rita, do you want to, do you want to speak to that one? What can it teach? Well, first of all, it, it can teach people to connect with each other on a very basic level. Like the example I brought up earlier with the sharing of food, um, that we all have that in common, but it can also particularly in, in with the aspect of intangible heritage, um, cultural practices that are very unique to communities. Um, they can teach people in encountering that practice to be more open towards other communities and see that valid uh, um, practices just because they don't happen to gel with what you're not what what you've experienced growing up or living in your own community um, that this may still be a valuable thing to practice that this is a valuable faith to hold on to it's a valid way of singing or dancing even though to your own eyes it may look a bit silly to other eyes it's, it's very beautiful um and i think in in that sense there there is no limit to who heritage is trying to address because essentially we're, we're we're approaching this from a very, um, I guess, idealistic point of view that essentially everybody can encounter everybody else's heritage when they meet each other in particularly our port communities. And there shouldn't be any boundaries between that. But at the same time, I think we're also quite respectful in the sense that we're not pressing people into sharing aspects of their um, heritage where they think, oh, this is a bit too private. So in that case, you could say that heritage doesn't necessarily have to teach everybody, but by withholding heritage or certain aspects of it, it may still teach somebody to respect that this is maybe not their place to butt in. What has been your experiences with that, Claire? Yeah, I think I think you're right. I think in one way it, it connects us and brings us closer together and um we can learn from our collective experiences and, and the experiences in the past but then it, it can also yeah help us to respect difference in in our different cultures and and to learn from each other in that in that sense um i think on a on a sort of a larger almost existential level uh, i kind of referenced this earlier that our heritage and our history uh is it's it's a series of stories and sort of archetypes that we've played out over the centuries and that um, we can always learn from those archetypes um, whether they've been negative or positive ones um, and also just in terms of the time the deep time and uh, um, you know our own sense of mortality it can I think heritage can teach us to you know take a step back and remember we're just a drop in the ocean and that you know, generations of people have passed through and, and, and maybe not to worry so much. Or the flip side to that may be that actually we are so here for such a short time that, you know, um, let's get on with it and, and make most out of it. Um, so I think it can teach us those positive things as well. Something that I've been thinking about <laughs> is that in terms of like who is heritage teaching, in the context of a kind of local um, history, um, understanding of port life, every one of the port communities we have has its own unique sense of its history and its identity. You know, Pembroke Dock was built as a naval shipyard and it has a sort of legacy of that, Fishguard and the cruise liners and the twin towns of Fishguard and Goodick and a long sort of, uh, his, you know, medieval and even older sort of history. And then, you know, Rosslare Harbour as a village that's um, linked to Rosslare Europort but has its very own, you know, unique identity. Dublin Port and the sort of port, um, neighborhoods of Dublin as being distinct kind of docker working class sort of neighborhoods. And then Hollyhead too, as this endless 
like long, long relationship of the London to Holyhead Road, the toll road, the eventually the the bridge across the Menai Straits, and the the sort of history of the Dublin Holyhead crossing, and Holyhead as a place that also has a medieval past. Those localized, unique experience. I think academics can learn that we're used to large level compare and contrast a lot of the time kind of meta histories you know we often work at a sort of um bigger scale but that this kind of community work reminds one of the kind of importance of of local understanding situated knowledge is what it's called sometimes in human geography um yeah of of knowledge in place rather than sort of like larger scale sort of comparative studies. And I have a question to follow up actually, which um, I think is a good one to sort of uh, come towards the end, which is, um, you know, we have in our project several cross-cutting themes, you know, important sort of socioeconomic themes, you know, social equality, gender mainstreaming, you know, trying to address gender imbalance um, in some of the representation of the material we gather, uh, climate, environmental um, uh, issues. And um, I guess the question is, what, and I'll ask this to maybe, I'll maybe go, go to Rita again, what is the role of, of heritage or the heritage that we've been working on constructing? How, how does that address these issues? How do we imagine it uh, addressing these issues? I'm, I'm not sure we're going to succeed in addressing climate change or halting uh, climate change, but I think we've, we've always kept an eye on the rich natural history and beauty that attaches to each one of our communities, even to places like Pembroke Dock, which have grown up in quite an industrialised corner in Pembrokeshire. But at the same time, when you just look one or two miles outside Pembroke Dock, there is rich natural beauty to be found. And the people of Pembroke Dock are very protective of their location. So in that sense, there there is an awareness for the surroundings that they're in. There is an awareness that when there was this large oil spill, I think it was in the 80s, that it did endanger the community because all of a sudden you had to take stock of um, how does the industrial heritage impact other aspects of life? Um, and I think in one way or another that goes hand in glove then with social equality or gender mainstreaming because very often when you look at the work in the port themselves, it's very male, it's, it's a very manly industry. But I think we have been doing quite a bit of good work in involving women in our projects and showing that there is also a lesser recorded aspect to port heritage. Um, once you just look outside the gates of the docks or the dockyards themselves um, and take stock of women's lives and how they have many, many cases quietly supported um, the work in the ports themselves. and. Um, have given social stability um, or social structure so that the, the port work was able to be undertaken. My personal favourite is still that a lot of pubs around um, Welsh port towns were managed historically by women because their husbands were away or their, their brothers or fathers were away on the sea trading along the coast. So somebody had to keep the pub going, and that was usually the woman in the in the his, uh, in the family. So that is a very interesting aspect, and I think we have succeeded so far in giving quite a few women a voice um, to share aspects of their history um, in the port towns, to share women's experiences with the sea, um, either directly by going to the sea themselves or by experiencing it passively. Um, on land. Um, and in that way, I think we can kind of contribute to social equality because th this, this is, I think, one of our largest aspects in our project um, that we are trying to help communities um, to be less of a transient zone for people who are traveling through and basically improve the economic 
and therefore the, the social equality situation in these port towns um, simply by saying these are communities worth visiting and these are communities um, spending a few pounds or euros if you like in these towns and so help local economy and um, basically give the whole local community a bit of an economic lift and um, in that way contribute to a wider social equality be that across gender lines or even be that across climate change lines uh, because very often you find that the poorest people in in a society are the ones who experience climate change the first so it's it's not just this usual north south um global dynamic where um countries in the global south are the ones or other ones who most early experience the strong effects or the, the negative aspects of climate change. But you also see that in the global north, that usually it's uh, the impoverished who reap the fallout as the first. So maybe we can fight the big changes or the, the big fights, um, but we're probably just going to be with, with our project, a very, very tiny sand grain in, in the wider cogworks. Um, I think I think heritage definitely can help to fight the big fights um, uh, by being reflective. I think is the is the key, and I think like you're saying, Rita, definitely the stories that um, form part of our project that community members have contributed. There are stories about, like you say, women's lives. Any of these these kinds of stories are. are talking points and thinking points so that it's at least it's helping people to think differently about things like gender in the past how it was enacted in the past and how how it's treated nowadays um and i think the same for um things like climate change if you're to even looking at pre-industrial ways of life which uh do feature in our in our stories um you know, quite ancient heritage that people had a very different relationship to landscape in the past. And and I think, you know, that maybe that can help us to think differently about how we relate to it now, this very same places that we're inhabiting now, you know. Uh, but on a more practical level, you know, we've got stories from um, Dublin Bay biosphere and eco projects that are taking place there. And I think uh, even just uh, highlighting those is, is a way that our, like you say, Rita, that our project can make a small contribution to the bigger issues. I think there's also a certain power in juxtaposition that we've been putting those environmental stories about biosphere, about uh, heritage conservation, together with art and creative work together with film together with stories about people's family history together with the story of the technology that made these ports what they are uh sitting together with yeah like the sea empress oil spill milford haven sitting next to something about a, a church that was demolished to make way for a refinery or like a village with a church demolished to make way for a refinery next to a reference in uh cymbeline of shakespeare's cymbeline to the haven next to something else putting all these things together gives a sense that heritage isn't simple it's compound and it it's everyone's story so if you weave in women's voices if you weave in cultural diversity linguistic diversity if you weave in environment um in, intertwined with human agency and technology that's a richer sense of of people's lives and of people's histories and that's that's the kind of heritage that i think that has real value and that we, we can contribute a little bit of, in our own small way to that that conversation. So I guess um, we're coming to the end now of our um, podcast, but uh, maybe I'll ask my colleagues for some wrapping up thoughts, Rita and Claire, what, what do you have any sort of concluding thoughts? I think as, as a concluding thought, um, I would say that hopefully I'm, I'm not the steward of any one of our port communities heritage but I just feel myself in the position of being a very privileged enabler because ultimately it's each port community's own different little heritages contributing to a wider heritage but um, I'm, I'm just the person who maybe gives somebody a tool to share the heritage in a wider 
our forum, if either of that is online or by organizing a talk or a little event um, and having a couple of pairs of ears listening to them. Um, if, if I have managed to do that, to enable a community to be their own stewards of heritage in, in a more, um, one, and I wouldn't say successful way, but in a, in a way that reaches a wider audience, I'm extremely happy to have contributed to that. Um, just, yeah, agreeing with uh, Risa, I think uh, definitely the, the communities that we're working with, they are the stewards. And, and I think what's important just to remember is that, you know, for some people, uh, it seems like heritage is, is just the preserve of people who go to heritage societies and groups and that there's only a specific part of the community that are really interested in it. But actually, just from the conversation we've had, I feel it's important to add that um, there's something in heritage and the stories within those heritages for everybody if 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 we just look and um and and, and think on them you know and uh, um yeah heritage is great <laughs> and that's all we've got time for today uh, thanks for listening to port stories we've been uh, james smith rita singer and claire nolan from ports past and present um and ports past and present is funded by the uh, european regional development fund under the island wales cooperation program and uh, we'll have a lot of interesting podcasts for you as the year goes on and we have some of our Port Fest events coming up, so we'll look forward to having more soon. And thanks for listening. Bye.